But Exodus chapter 17, starting at verse 8, it says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Joshua, or when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua disconfitted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today and ask the Lord to help us respond to his word that's about to go forth. Would you pray with me today? Father, we come before you and we thank you for your presence that's in this place. We thank you for this wonderful group of people and I'm asking now that as your word goes forth that it would electrify the atmosphere, that it would spark hope and faith in the heart of each hearer. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Lord, I'm praying right now that your spirit would confirm this word and that there would be a witness of your spirit in this place. Anything or anyone that would seek to hinder your will from being accomplished, I bind its influence right now. And I lose faith into this atmosphere in revelation that we would understand the word that is about to go forth. And Lord, help us, Lord Jesus, to look to you. We ask in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. One more time, clap your hands to the Lord. You can be seated. We're thankful for each one of you who are gathered here today. And we are um, excited about what is happening and what is about to happen. There is a principle we need to grasp, though. And I've said it before, but the time is now. We can't, we're not looking anymore to what is about to happen. We're looking now to the beginning stages of that. And so we, um, we need the Lord to deliver us of any fear, insecurity, or um, anything from past experiences that would hinder, anything that would hinder. Whatever it is, anything that would hinder uh, us being used by God the way he desires. I'm speaking for individuals. Each individual, you need to ask God to search your heart if you're unaware of the hang up, the hold up. You need to ask God to tell you what it is. If you know what it is, well, it's decision time. We've got to give it to God so that we can step into what he so desperately desires to use us in. You need to know Jesus loves you. I think somebody needs to hear that today. You need to understand Jesus loves you. He, he wants more for your life. He wants you to step into the fullness of the purpose he has for each of you. So we need to get this revelation today. We just need to surrender to God. Things we may not understand yet, we need to ask the Lord to teach us. It's one of the reasons why you got the Holy Ghost if you've been filled, to teach you. So with all of that in mind, we go to our text and 
the Israelites fought many battles in possessing the promised land. It was not something that was a unique one-time experience. They fought many battles. They were fighting all the time. That was part of possessing the promise. Warfare. You have to defeat the enemies that would oppose God's promise in your life. Promises don't fall in your lap. Promises are possessed when the hearer believes the promise maker. And we take action, intentional action to pursue after it. That we know that there will be resistance and, and enemies. And so we have to be willing to war for the prophecy. So Israel had this promised land that they're on their way to and on one particular day, one particular battle, in one season of this journey into the promised land, Amalek goes to fight Israel. What's interesting is Amalek, they're a group of people that are descendants from Esau. You have the children of Israel, descendants of Jacob, seeking to possess the promise. So really, it's a family battle. Two brothers, their descendants, fighting each other. Well, we can draw early conclusions that that same thing can come up in the church. One promise, two sides. What side are you on is what I would ask. Are you on the Lord's side or are you opposing the will of God? Amalek, the people of Amalek, the Amalekites, they oppose the will of God for it was the will of God that the people of God go in to possess the promise. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, this is just a side note to set the framework. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, the one that preached in Acts chapter 2, hears these words from Jesus, I've, I've got to die. Peter doesn't like that. It was the will of God. This was the plan of God. Peter didn't like it. And he said, no, you're not going to have to die. You don't have to do all that. And Jesus rebukes Peter and says, get thee Behind me, Satan. Adversary. Anything or anyone that opposes the will of God is a Satan. That's in the book. Adversary. So the question I ask before we get any further into this message is, is your life, is your mindset, is your spirit, in opposition, whether you realize it or not, to the will of God and what God is seeking to do here. We've got to be bold enough, adult enough to search our heart and let the Lord search our heart to see, God, if there is anything in me that would seek to oppose what you are so desperately trying to do. My prayer is, God, I may not fully see it, but I'm asking you to do whatever it takes to get me to a place where I'm no longer standing in opposition to you, but I'm behind it 100%. Peter would have never known he was a Satan until Jesus called him out on it. But Jesus loved Peter enough to say, hey, you need to get in line because the words you're speaking are going to lead you down a path of destruction. You can't oppose the will of God and survive. You can't seek to desire to do it your own way and expect to stay standing at the outcome of the battle. No, if the Lord said this is my will, it is going to be accomplished regardless of who believes it or not, regardless of who supports it or not. 
Thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus said is what we need to pray. Not my will, thy will. Jesus, even himself, was battling this uh, spirit of Satan, which Satan means adversary. So uh, the reason why the devil or the fallen Lucifer has coined this name Satan is because of the fact he is the ultimate adversary of God and the things of God. But anyone can be a Satan. Because anyone can be an adversary of the things of God. And so uh, what, we, what we have to understand is Jesus said, Thy will be done and, and thy kingdom come in earth as it is in heaven. And when he's in the garden, he doesn't want to do the will of God. His flesh doesn't want to do the will of the Spirit. He's battling it. Jesus did not resist it. He submitted to it. Now, he has a name above every other name. You may not want to submit to the will of God. You may struggle in your flesh to see the big picture. The disciples didn't see the big picture. You may struggle in your flesh to fully receive the revelation of what God is seeking to do. But we can't always walk by what we see. And if we can just get a witness of the Spirit in our life to understand. I may not understand it all or see it all, but I know this is of God. And so I'm going to trust God and submit to the will of God. You will be a part of something in these last days that will be victorious, will not be destroyed, will not be cast down. Why? Because you're a part of the church. The church is only going up. The church is only going forward. It doesn't matter what's happening out there or around us. If you're in the church, if you're submitted to the will of God, if you are locked into the purpose of God, there is nothing that will defeat you. We've got to understand that. And so the Malachites opposing Israelites and Rephidim, They go to fight. And Moses tells Joshua, get some men, go to fight. I will go to the top of the mountain with the rod of God and with Aaron and Hur. And they stand on the mountain. And Moses raises his hands. And as Moses raises his hands, the Israelites prevail. But when his hands go down, the enemy prevails. And so he raises his hands again. But after a while, they get heavy. And he can no longer keep his hands up on his own. He needs the help of Aaron and her. And so they stay his hands. They hold up his hands on both sides. And the enemy is defeated that day. We look at this and we, this is an interesting way to fight. Just all day. Looks foolish, right? That's, that doesn't appeal to the male ego in warfare. It's not real tough. It's not, uh, you know, anything that we would assume would win a victory. But because Moses' hands were up, the Israelites prevailed against the Amalekites. Now he had the rod of God in his hand, which all the rod of God was, was that same stick he had when God called him at the burning bush. God asked Moses, what's in your hand? He said, a rod. I'll use that. So an ordinary stick becomes known as the rod of God simply because Moses surrendered to God what was in his hand at the time God called him. I don't have what it takes to be used mightily of God. Moses just had a stick. We think that excuse is going to stand. <laughs> God's got his eye on you. He's not really interested in what's in your hand. He's only interested if, in the fact of, are you going to give him what's in your hand? So he's not interested in really what you have to offer. He's interested in your surrender. And so we see here in this, commentaries even explain this, this position of Moses 
the rod of God that he takes and, and lifts into the air with both hands in the air, all that is, is Moses signifying his dependence and surrender to God. That's all that was. When Moses is on top of the mountain, hands in the air, while the Israelites are fighting below, he is up there on the mountain with this posture of dependence on God. And that's the reason why the Israelites won that day. It wasn't because of their own might. It wasn't because of their own power. But God shows himself strong in the middle of a people that are not ashamed to display their surrender and dependence to God. And so we see here this. You want to win the battle? You want to win the battle in your life? You want to win the battle over your mind? You want to win the battle in your family? You want to win the battle in this church of moving forward in what God is calling us to? You want to win the war? Do you want to win the battle? Put your hands up. Just put your hands up. You don't have to strategize about how are we going to see it happen. You don't have to figure it out of, I don't really see how all the pieces are fitting together. That doesn't matter. Just put your hands up. Worship the Lord. Show your dependence on God. Live in a continual state of surrender. And watch the Lord's will be done in your midst. It looks foolish to the natural eye, but in the spirit, it is an antenna that opens a portal from heaven to earth that says, there's a person my power can flow through. There's a church that's not trying to do it their way. They only want to see my will be done in the earth. Their hands are up. That means they're not strategizing with their own human intellect. They understand it's not by might. It's not by power, but it is by my spirit. Their hands are up. They're dependent on me. I'm going to show myself strong in their midst. The principle was clear. When Moses' hands were up, they were winning. And when his hands were down, they were losing. It's real simple. Even in a worship service, even when we gather together, you can tell Generally, the people that are winning and the people that are losing. Hand hasn't been in the air for 30 minutes. There's something on their mind. There's something in their spirit. There's something that's numbed them to the presence of God. Don't be so judgmental. No, that's just an ob- obvious observation. Because the moment someone's heart surrenders to God and their hands are in the air, the Spirit of God will descend and deliver them of anything that has them bound. It doesn't take God long to set you free. But he is looking for someone that says, I can't do this on my own. Jesus I need you to win this battle. I can't overcome this addiction on my own. I can't set myself free. I can't overcome this depression on my own. I need you, Lord. And instantly, the moment your hands are in the air, you're on your way to a victory. You're on your way to winning the war. The enemy is about to be defeated in your life. You just got to put your hands up. Look at somebody and say, put your hands up. And sometimes life will continue to get worse and worse and worse and wear you down and the things you thought would bring you happiness do not bring you happiness anymore and you thought, I thought that would be the solution to fixing my problem and you realize, no, it's not in that. It's not in that. I thought this would fix it. I thought this would make it better and it's still not. There's still that, there's still that void. There's still that problem. There's still that, that emptiness on the inside and God's like, I'll take this away, and I'll take this away, and I'll move you here, and I'll do this here, and it's seeming like nothing's working out, and you're like, why can't I seem to get this out of my spirit? Well, God's going to keep 
putting it on you until you realize, hey, I just need to put my hands up. I just need to put my hands up and surrender to God and say, Lord, I see it now. My joy doesn't come in earthly possessions or in earthly aspects. My joy, my peace, my hope, my righteousness, it only comes from you. Look up. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. We take a closer look at this story, and all of a sudden, we begin to see how this story becomes personal. It's not just a story about Moses and Joshua and the Israelites. It's a story about each one of us. The adversary attacking, seeking to stop you before you step in to your promise. The adversary warring against you, seeking to take you out, to destroy you, to wear you out until you quit, give up, walk away. This story is a story for each one of us. For as we take a closer look in this passage, we understand this is me. Definitions of names in the Bible are significant. And it tells a story within a story. There's the literal story that's taking place, but when you say the definition of the name, all of a sudden you realize, hey, there's a bigger picture going on. There's a bigger story taking place. I see myself in this story. And we begin to understand the Israelites, the people of God, that's just the crowd. But there's two stars mentioned, Moses and Joshua. They're, they're the main figures in this story. One has his hands up, and one is fighting. Who are you? Which one are you in the story? The story tells us. For the name Moses means rescued. And the name Joshua means Jehovah saved or Jehovah rescued. So we see the one who's standing on the mountaintop with his hands raised, his name means rescued. And the one that's fighting the battle is the one whose name means Jehovah rescued. Jehovah rescued. A, a better name, a better way to even summarize it, Joshua, because his name means Jehovah saved or Jehovah rescued, you can just summarize it as the, the, the Savior, the Rescuer. By definition of these names, we know the ultimate Savior, Jesus Christ, but there's these types and shadows and these figureheads throughout the Old Testament that are pointing to the ultimate one. And in this story, Joshua, whose name means God saves, God rescues, he's the one fighting. And the one whose name means rescued, I was rescued. All he's doing is his hands are in the air. His hands are in the air. Are you seeing the picture yet? You don't have to fight your own battles. The Lord will fight your battles. But what causes God to fight for you is whether or not you are dependent on him. God's not fighting for someone who's trying to do it on their own. But the moment there's a person that says, God, here I am, gracefully broken, completely dependent on you, completely surrendered to you, I give up. I surrender. God goes to work on your behalf. The enemy you couldn't fight on your own. God will defeat that enemy. So while the one who is rescued has his hands up, the one whose name means rescuer is fighting. 
We've got to learn to stop trying to go through life on our own or stop trying to worry about a problem until the problem is resolved. It's not going to be resolved by your worry. It's not going to be resolved by your depression. It's not going to be fixed because there's such a burden in your spirit that, well, if I carry this burden long enough, God's going to fix it. No, God shows up in your midst when you surrender it to him. Cast your cares on him, for he careth for you. Surrender your pride to him and say, God, I'm not going to try to fix it anymore on my own but I'm giving it to you. Rescued is on the mountain with his hands up while Jehovah who rescues is down fighting the enemy. You want to know When this understanding gets deep in our spirit, I'm talking all times, not just when we feel God, but at all times, this posture, it's not just a posture that we have on Sunday, but it's when life hits us hard on Tuesday, you still going to Put your hands up, or are you going to put your hands up? You going to surrender? Are you going to stay dependent on God? Are we going to continually give ourselves to God the thing in our hand that we gave to God? Are we going to continually Keep it lifted up before the Lord. Well, things get hard. Life gets hard. Things have happened to me. Things have been said about me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. That may be true. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know who said what about me. You don't know who thinks what about me. So this isn't a contest about who has it worse off as a child of God, who's got the worst burden, the biggest struggle. If we're, if we're comparing our struggles, that's our idol. That's no longer, I hit something there. There's somebody here today that keeps magnifying the issue above their God. But the moment you fully surrender to God, that is the moment you are going to see the enemy defeated in your life. Get it out of your mind. Get it out of your spirit. And simply worship the Lord. Continual surrender to God. But it's hard. I get tired. I get weary. I know. So what happened when Moses' hands got heavy? Somebody on either side said, we're going to surrender together. You don't have to surrender on your own. You don't have to be the beacon of dependence on God on your own. But together, we as the rescued are going to stand on this mountain and continually keep this posture before the Lord. If you're the only worshiper in the house, that's a sad story. There shouldn't be the titles, they're the praisers in the church. No, all of us should be the praisers for all of us have been rescued has Jesus set you free has he washed away your sins has he delivered you has he brought you up and out then worship the Lord lift those hands in the air give God praise
Let's just take a moment and practice that. You may have come in here heavy in your spirit, but the Lord is seeking to set some of you free once and for all today. And the moment you say, God, I'm fully surrendered to you once and for all, it's not going to be some practice I do on Sunday, but go back to life as usual on Monday. No, right now, in this moment, my hands are in the air. I have been rescued from sin. I have been rescued from addiction. I have been rescued from an eternity in hell and I am not ashamed to lift my hands in the midst of God have you been rescued today I ask you what what has God rescued you from you need to get that in your mind right now what has God rescued you from now that you have it in your mind why don't you take a moment and just worship the Lord hands in the air, voice lifted to the Lord, and just take a moment and pray. Let's pray right now, church. Let's pray. I sense in this atmosphere right now distraction, the inability to focus your mind on the goodness of God and what he's done in your life. You need to focus your mind right now on everything God's done for you. You need to focus your mind on Jesus again right now. And you need to remember everything he's brought you from. And you need to worship him. You need to worship him. The goodness of God leadeth men to repentance. Take a moment, lift your voice to the Lord. Press past your flesh. You may be weary in your spirit, and if you can't have the strength to lift him up on your own, find somebody next to you and say, help me lift my hands. There it is right now. There's a liberty beginning to fill this, this room right now. If you need to, find somebody and say, help me lift my hands. Help me lift my hands. And right now as you do that, there is healing that will flow down. Hands lifted, voice lifted to the Lord right now. Soramando You're heavy in your spirit. You're burdened in your mind. Some things don't seem to be working out. But right now, God is not interested in your concern of how things will end up. He just wants to know, what are you going to do in this moment? Are you going to surrender to me in this moment? Or are you going to surrender to me in this moment? Are you going to give yourself to me all over again in this moment? You're on top of the mountain. The battle is raging. It looks like the enemy's winning. But all you got to do is put your hand hands in the air. You've got to surrender your heart to God, and the Lord is going to begin to fight for you. The Lord is going to begin to turn to flight the enemy. Don't miss this moment. God is extending to some of you a moment where he'll turn it all around right now. Lift your hands. Lift your heart to the Lord. Sando ramando satalabarando shatadabaye. Yalabarando satalabarando satadabaye. There's some that aren't hearing me today, and I'm sorry to tell you this, but nothing's going to change until this is your response. Surrender. You'll still be frustrated in your spirit. You'll still have that bitterness. You'll still have that struggle. You still won't be able to tap into what's going on around you. But all you have to do is surrender. Hear my plea today. Hear my heart's cry today. The Lord Jesus Christ loves every single person person in this room today. There is nothing he cannot do for you, and there is nothing that he does not desire to do for you, but he is interested in your surrender. The victory cannot be won until you surrender. Nothing is going to change until you surrender. You've got to break out The difference between Peter and Judas. Peter surrendered. 
Judas did not. He gave in to his flesh and never surrendered back to God. Peter did. He failed. He was an adversary to the will of God. But in the end, he surrendered. I ask the Lord right now to reveal to you in this present moment who you are and respond to the Lord with surrender. Your response determines the outcome. Not me, not God, you. Moses would have kept his hands down because he was just too tired that day. The Israelites would have been wiped off the face of the earth. In the balance right now is your future. In the balance right now is whether or not you will be a part of the promises of God. Not because of me, not because of anybody in this church, but because simply We surrender or not to the Lord. This is my posture on Sunday through physical worship to God. But this is also my spiritual posture every day that I live. God, I trust you with my money. I trust you with my home. I trust you with my finances. I trust you, God, with my family, my job, my very breath that I breathe. I trust you with it, God. I'm not turning off the Jesus switch. I turn it on to come to church and I shut it off on Monday when I go to work. No, I am a Christian. And part of being a Christian is I live a life of service and surrender to the Lord. why it feels this way in here right now? Because the Malachites and the Israelites, spiritually speaking, are in this room. Let's not oppose the will of God. Let's not oppose what God is wanting to do. Second Chronicles 20. It's a very interesting passage of Scripture for once again the Israelites are fighting enemies. And once again it's the people that are descendants of Esau. Hmm, is that a coincidence? And this time, Jehoshaphat's like, God, what do we do? They take their families, their wives, their little ones, their children, they come before the Lord, just like we're doing right now. And a prophet stands up and says, Hearken ye all Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, And King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude, their enemies. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go you down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff, of Z's, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, establish yourselves, stand still, and see 
the salvation of the Lord. Judah and Jerusalem, fear not nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord will be with you. In response to this, they bowed their head to the ground. They fell before the Lord and worshiped the Lord. The response to a word from God should be worship. And they prepare and they rise up early in the morning and they go forth to the wilderness. And Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah, believe in the Lord your God, so you shall be established. Believe his prophets, so you shall prosper. And we, when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when, everyone say when, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. The two stories that we've read are the same. Moses rescued, hands in the air, and is a sign of surrender to God. Joshua, whose name means God saves, God rescues, is the one down in the valley fighting the battle. In this story, the people of God hear a word from God. You don't have to fight today. You don't have to fight any longer. All you need to do is establish yourself, stand still, quit trying to do it on your own, and see the salvation of the Lord. And the Israelites come together and they appoint praisers and worshipers who lead the way into this battle. And while they are busy worshiping the Lord, all of a sudden they visibly can see the Lord fighting for them. Just like Moses could see Joshua fighting. These Israelites see the Lord fighting for them. They are seeing the salvation of the Lord at work in their life in this very moment. And it all started when they just stopped everything else and simply worshipped the Lord. And everything turned around and what they could not accomplish on their own, God finished in a day. I feel to tell somebody today that if you'll stop trying to do it on your own, stop trying to figure it out on your own, stop trying to carry this burden on your own, what you've been trying to accomplish for months or years on your own, God could turn it all around in a day. The day you decide, I'm done carrying this. But I'm here to worship the Lord. I give it to God in spite of everything else. That should be the response. That should be the response. So today, I ask you this question. What is it that's got you held up? You need to give it to God. There needs to be that dependence and that surrender in this place today.